Is this YouTube's craziest DMCA abuse story yet? Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we find ourselves once again exploring the wonderful and wacky world of YouTube at large. Now, if you've been in virtual legality before, you know we talk about YouTube at length because there have been so many news items that have popped up with respect to creators, the terms and conditions, COPPA, and now most recently, I think DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and abuse related to copyright strikes has really popped up on people's radar. We talked about MXR Plays and Jukin Media, and this particular story that I'm about to talk to you about today was one that really highlighted the issue for a lot of folks. If you followed the channel, if you are watching this, you probably know that we have talked in the past about really kind of trying to see both sides of the equation here, read through the law, see how someone like Jukin Media, who otherwise looks like a shady actor, a bad actor, might be operating within the rights that are afforded to them by the law. In this particular case, I think this is a very, very clear indicator of abuse. This story is one where I think the bad actors here, in particular Warner Brothers, are very clearly bad actors. And I think it is a good reason to highlight how the DMCA needs to be reformed because there's basically not going to be any penalty for Warner Brothers acting in this fashion. So without further ado, let's actually take a look at the story in question. I would like to introduce you to YouTuber Matt Binder. This is his channel. I've pulled it up here. And he streams a show called Doomed with Matt Binder, which he describes as a left-leaning political podcast video stream vlog type show where he discusses things like the Democratic presidential primary. If you look at the middle of your screen, you see a stream here that says Iowa Democratic debate post show with Jordan Uhl, where Mr. Binder and Mr. Uhl were going to talk about what had happened in the Democratic debate, kind of post-mortem it, have a discussion. And this video in particular wound up getting a copyright strike from Warner Brothers, who owns CNN and maybe could have believed that CNN footage used in this stream was violative of their copyrights. However, the issue with that is that they issued the copyright strike before the stream existed. So the way YouTube works, you're allowed to schedule live streams. Uh, You've probably seen us schedule things like Virtual Legality Live. I think we scheduled for maybe 10 minutes in advance. The latest two hugs are better than one that we did uh, with my brother. But you can schedule those streams in advance to let people know that they exist. And it appears that that's what happened here. Let's take a look at the actual story that Mr. Binder wrote, because as it turns out, Mr. Binder is also an author at Mashable. So he put out this article, and we're looking at Mashable right now, called YouTube Reversed My Bogus Copyright Strike After I Threatened to Write This. So we're starting at the end of the story. Ultimately, that video that we just looked at is, of course, now available. But the story that he tells is very, very interesting because the DMCA gives a lot of power to IP holders, yes, but it also has a lot of kind of strictures and requirements that are associated with that law that are supposed to prevent abuse. Clearly, that's not happening when something like this happens. So we want to kind of dive into why, why something like this occurs, how it can be fixed. And this is by far one of the most severe examples of DMCA abuse that I have seen. So let's take a look at this actual story. It says, can you receive a copyright strike on YouTube for content that doesn't even exist? You can, and I would know because it happened to me. You see, I host a political podcast, Doomed with Matt Binder, which I also stream live on YouTube. The left-leaning show covers everything from the far right to tech policy, from internet conspiracy theories to the Democratic primary race, which brings me to Tuesday, January 14th, the night of the CNN Democratic primary debate in Iowa. Earlier in the evening, I had scheduled a YouTube live stream as I always do the night of a debate, in order to discuss the event with the progressive activist Jordan Uhl after CNN's broadcast wrapped up. I'd even labeled it a post-democratic debate show featuring Uhl's name directly in the scheduled stream title. These post-debate shows consist entirely of webcam feeds of my guest and myself, split-screen style, breaking down the night's events. Now, if that's entirely the case, and I can't pretend that I went through all of Mr. Binder's video on this, there's actually nothing that could possibly be copyright infringing, right? They're talking about something else. They're actually talking about something of public and political importance. So we actually get into other areas of the Constitution that could be impacted when we start talking about how the Copyright Act works. But without dragging all that extra law in, suffice it to say, 
This strike was issued before the video existed, so it's impossible for WB or CNN or anybody working for either of them to know what the video consisted of. And that's when this happened. Shortly after setting up the stream, so you go and you hit some buttons, you hit some toggles, you say when it's going to air, you say what kind of uh, categories it goes in, like news and politics for this one, undoubtedly. You set all that up and then a thing pops up on your YouTube channel says, hey, we've got a stream that's going to come up at 9 p.m. or whenever. Shortly after setting up that stream, I received an email from YouTube, copyright takedown notice, your video has been taken down from YouTube. The notice informed me that I had received a copyright strike for my scheduled stream. Now, strikes are worse than claims, right? We've talked about it in virtual legality before, but the way YouTube operates is they kind of have a middle road between a pure DMCA takedown uh, and a claim on the copyright involved in your video. Someone can come in and say, hey, that's my copyright content, so we'll allow the video to stay up, no big deal, but all the advertising money comes to us because that's our IP. And that can be a hassle for certain people as it stands. We actually saw earlier this week that a number of people that reviewed the latest Picard show wound up with certain claims and strikes associated with their videos uh, because they use trailer footage and those kinds of things. That can happen, especially when you're talking about movies and TV shows and things that do have an intellectual property life of their own. But claiming is different from striking. When someone actually asks to have it blocked, taken down, and struck, YouTube essentially holds those in its records. And if you get three strikes, you're out. Very baseball-centric, but it's the truth. And so what happened here is this gentleman, Mr. Binder, got this strike, which disabled his live streaming for three months. And if he got three strikes, it says YouTube would just shut down my channel completely, removing all of my content. According to the YouTube notice, a person by the name of Michael Bentcover issued the copyright strike on behalf of Warner Brothers Entertainment, which owns CNN, the hosts of the last Democratic debate. So this was a manual strike notice, and we can actually go, we can look in Mr. Bentcover's uh, LinkedIn profile, and we can see that it matches up what we would expect from a person that's issuing these kinds of manual strikes. His title is apparently... Director Worldwide Online Enforcement Operations, with over 16 years experience in anti-piracy and network management related positions, and over 10 years experience in the entertainment industry, Michael is deeply involved in intellectual property, copyright, and trademark content protection issues for film, television, games, and properties from Warner Brothers, CNN News, Turner, Cartoon Network, Turner Sports, Adult Swim, and HBO Max Worldwide, which doesn't exist yet, but he's involved in them as of right now. In any event, what I want you to put a pin in for this particular piece of the video is that he has 16 years experience. This is what he does for a living. If it came down to it, this is not the type of person that can say, oh, I didn't know what button I hit. I didn't know what I had said. And so, judge, please don't hold this as willful. This wasn't a maliciously wrong kind of act that I took. This is the kind of person where that argument very likely isn't going to fly. He does this for a living. He follows these kinds of things online. He's the person in charge of issuing these strikes for Warner Brothers. And so with that background, what he does can be taken as a certain level of sophistication, that he knows what he's doing, he knows what he's about, and he did it anyway. But that's Mr. Bentcover. Let's continue with just a little bit of the analysis in this article. And we see that because of the copyright strike, I was unable to stream my post-debate show on YouTube that night. So I also want to point out that particular line of the article because one of the things that comes up when we talk about the DMCA and we talk about DMCA abuse is how did you get harmed? And when we talk about YouTube, it's very worthwhile to mention that temporality, how fast you can get up a video, how fast you can get up something related to a news event, something that is contemporaneous to what you are talking about, is very, very important. In general, people are searching for those terms. They want to talk about that thing pretty close to when that thing happened. So when you talk about YouTube even demonetizing a video for a period of time related to a news event, you are talking about actual legitimate damages that someone could probably show accrued on their channel that I would have gotten X many more views if I were allowed to have put this video up in that 24 hour period. I didn't get those views because of this abusive action. And now folks, we should talk about that. That's the reality when we talk about social media media video engagement 
And that's a reality that I can attest to because you can see in virtual legality how different things kind of work depending on how close they are to the news item in question. He actually went and he talked to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is very involved in these kinds of data privacy issues, DMCA abuse issues online. And the manager of policy and activism, Catherine Trendacosta, said, your case is the most extreme I've heard about. Congratulations. This is the first time I've heard about this happening to something that didn't contain anything. And I've heard a lot of really intense stories about what's happening on YouTube, which is exactly the reason why we're making this video, because as a lawyer interested in these kinds of issues, interested in the DMCA, broadly thinking that that kind of structure is maybe a good one for what we're talking about here to allow things like video sharing services to exist, but doesn't like how it is actually used in operation right now. This is also one of the most extreme examples that I have heard of. And then Ms. Trendacosta actually explains why this is such a significant issue and what we're about to pop into in the text of the DMCA itself. The law requires them to have a good faith belief. Legally, you have to sign something that says you looked at the content and that there was material found that is yours. If there is no material, that's impossible. Absolutely it is. And that's one of the things we're going to highlight. Finally, before Mr. Binder actually got his video up, I wanted to highlight this because this is actually kind of crazy to me. To contest a copyright strike, YouTube allows users to submit a counterclaim, giving the claimant 10 days to respond. My first claim was actually denied, effectively saying it was unclear whether I had a valid reason to file a counter notification. Now that might have been an automated response. I can't speak to that. But just on its face, that's relatively crazy. We're about to go look at the text of the DMCA. But one of the things that happens in that text is basically that it's a battle of the notices, that the service provider, the YouTubes of the world, really aren't in a position to evaluate the validity of either side's notice, whether that's the original intellectual property holder or the person that says, hey, that's not their intellectual property or I use fair use or whatever it is. They aren't really in a position to evaluate that. That's a legal question. And so the service provider has these kinds of broad rights to essentially listen to everybody that, okay, we listen to the takedown, we take it down, we listen to the counter, we put it back up. YouTube actually stepping in at this point to say, oh, we're not sure about your counter notification is unusual. And I think is largely reflective of the fact that you don't really have a good lawsuit against YouTube for erroneously taking down your video as much as the actual real intellectual property holder, if they have a legitimate claim, has a lawsuit against YouTube if they don't. So you have this kind of bifurcation of leverage and rights. And I think that's how you get to the YouTubes of the world saying, okay, we accept a takedown notice almost instantaneously. And we don't accept that counterclaim unless we're really happy with it. Of course, the more conspiratorial minded among you might say, hey, those IP holders are bigger corporations. They're more evil. And the little YouTubers are the ones that YouTube doesn't care about. Perhaps you're right. But I think you can also answer it just with respect to the law and whether or not a little YouTuber has the right to actually sue YouTube for an erroneous takedown, which as we've talked about in respect of reading their terms and conditions, they probably don't. YouTube reserves the right to basically show whatever they want and take down whatever they want. And so you really don't have a good legal claim against them. But with all that said, with this crazy story out there, let's actually just remind ourselves of what the DMCA actually says. As we like to do in virtual legality, we go to the source material. So here we are in our favorite 17 USC section 512 limitations on liability relating to material online. So if this is the first time you're watching a virtual legality video talking about the DMCA, I want to give you the short version of this. We have longer videos where we dive into all this language in general, but basically the way this works, and we're really only talking about contributory infringement here, is that the YouTubes of the world aren't going to be liable for infringing material that is found on their service if when they get a valid notice that has all these bells and whistles on it, they immediately take it down. Because the other concern, the concern that was trying to be addressed by this law is that YouTube as a business model can't exist if everything that goes on there is instantaneously infringing and YouTube could be sued out of existence. So Basically, this law says we like the YouTubes of the world. We like sharing services online. And so they have this safe harbor where, hey, you can put up whatever you want on YouTube if they are told or if they receive actual knowledge of an infringement and they take it down immediately, they're going to be fine. But in order for that notice of infringement to be something that YouTube has to act on, 
it has to have certain qualifications. Here's the elements of notification. It has to be signed. It has to identify what work they're talking about, which in and of itself is a problem here, right? You don't actually have a work, unless you're talking about the thumbnail. You don't have a work to actually claim on this. Instead, all you have is the future existence of some kind of video which you believe will infringe on you. But that's not good enough. That's not infringing. And so your identification of a copyrighted work is problematic in and of itself. But on YouTube, here's how it works. Once you schedule that live stream technologically, you actually have a web page. You actually have something that you can link to people to send them to go wait for that live stream to start. So in terms of how the YouTube notification process works, the WB actually had the ability to point this at a claimed copyrighted work because that page existed, that the YouTube systems could see it, could knock it down, could issue that strike, even though the video wasn't in existence. And this might be something that YouTube wants to look at at the back end, that maybe their forms for DMCA takedown notices should not be allowing things that don't exist yet, that are only scheduled streams. I don't know whether they have kind of the, the flags on their web servers to identify that the video hasn't taken place yet, but it might be something that they want to look at. You also have to identify the material that is claimed to be infringed in that work. You have to have information reasonably sufficient to per permit the service provider to contact the complaining party, not generally an issue with YouTube, since everybody has accounts. And here's the biggie. You have to make a statement that the complaining party, the WB, has a good faith belief that use of the material in the manner complained of is not authorized by the copyright owner, its agent, or the law. Now, there is no actual material here. There is no work. So even though we've talked about good faith belief being a very, very broad and generous kind of obligation, that we looked at Universal Music versus Lens, and we saw that the court basically said, hey, if you put a memo in your file that says we at least thought about what fair use rights might be, then that probably meets a good faith standard, provided that you didn't lie about everything that you wrote in that memo. Because it's so broad, very often the IP holder has this kind of general authority to issue this notice, even if they're wrong. But where the work doesn't exist, I think you have a real problem with good faith belief. And then you combine that with that LinkedIn profile of that gentleman that says, I've been doing this for 16 years. I control this process for all of the WB's various intellectual property outfits. This is not the kind of person that can claim they had a good faith belief on issuing a takedown notice, a full strike on a video that doesn't exist. This is crazy. That's why I named this video the craziest story yet, because this is crazy. Now you say, Rick, isn't there a penalty for somebody that just goes absolutely abusive in this law? And the answer to that is yes, there is. We've talked about this before, but 512F here says any person who knowingly materially misrepresents under this section. Now that is a whole lot of qualifiers, right? So you can think of this sentence in the law as something that could have just said any person who misrepresents something, any person who lies, right? Knowingly and materially actually qualify that, make it harder to have this section apply. So let's take knowingly out of it. We could say any person who materially misrepresents. So that's the first qualifier. That says, okay, a white lie or a lie that doesn't actually affect things, we are not going to come after you. You can't actually have this liability under this section. Say, okay, so materially actually does limit the field of those things quite a bit. Now we add a second qualifier. Now it's knowingly materially misrepresents. So not only does it have to be significant, white lies don't count. You have to know you are lying when you do the lie. If it's a mistake, this doesn't apply. It has to be knowing. It has to be important. And it has to be a lie. In this particular case, I think we might have actually met that qualification. This video doesn't exist, folks. And strike is the highest level of thing that you can do to a YouTube content creator. Now, what does F actually get you? It gets you damages, including costs and attorney's fees incurred by the alleged infringer, by any copyright owner or copyright owner's authorized licensee, or by a service provider, YouTube, who is injured by the lie. So again, we go back to, this is very difficult to prove. 
This is one of the reasons why ultimately this winds up going back up on the service. Although in Mr. Binder's case, if you read the rest of that article, and I will link it in the description to the video, you'll see that it only actually went up after YouTube denied his claim when he said he was going to write an article in Mashable about it. And that's how he got his video back up, which is obviously not an option for most of us and is absolutely ridiculous as to how YouTube should be perceiving an issue like this. But that's apparently what happened. As always in virtual legality, we're kind of taking these sources on face and assuming that they are alleging everything correctly. But if we take that story on its face, we can see that this is a significant problem in the DMCA. And you can only get those damages that you can prove. Very difficult. We can say, hey, if I didn't get this live stream up in the first day, maybe it would have had a thousand more views. Maybe that thousand more views is worth whatever it is on YouTube, five bucks. And then maybe I have a $5 claim, but that isn't going to be worth bringing a legal action. So this is when we talk about things like reform, right? This is when we talk about things like what can we change about this law to make it less abusive? And this is one of those areas where I think we might actually start to look at maybe there should be a penalty provision, right? You've already got a very high threshold knowing material misrepresentations. You have to know you lied. It had to be important and you had to do it anyway. And it hurt somebody. If you get to that level, perhaps we need to start putting a penalty in place. There are statutes, there are laws that have essentially a kind of strict liability, liquidated damages provision that says, hey, if you find yourself under this section, you actually owe $10,000, just period, right? Or some amount of money that makes sense to go after for a litigate, a litigation, right? That you want to go, you want to get that money. It makes sense to you because your $5 claim, maybe even your $50 claim doesn't make sense to go after Warner Brothers Entertainment because they've got a lot of lawyers on retainer and they're going to make your life very, very difficult, even when this is very, very obviously an abusive situation. So I do think maybe Congress, maybe the legislature needs to look at something like the DMCA, needs to look at potentially changing this up a bit. But that's just my opinion on that. Please leave comments to this video. Tell me what you think about the DMCA. We've obviously talked about MXR. We've talked about Jukin. We've talked about fair use. This isn't even a fair use issue because the thing didn't exist yet. So we don't even have to get into fair use. Look at all these boxes that you have to check. I have a good faith belief that the use of the material in the manner complained of is not authorized. This notification is accurate. Under penalty of perjury, I'm authorized to act on behalf of the owner of the exclusive right. I acknowledge that under 512F, a knowing material misrepresentation may be subject to damages. And I understand that abuse of this tool will result in termination of my YouTube account. Now you can pretty much guarantee that Warner Brothers Entertainment isn't going anywhere in respect of its YouTube account. I can't speak for Mr. Bentcover in particular, but I would be very surprised if YouTube took any significant action on this kind of abuse. But we can certainly expect to see these things more and more if nothing at all happens to those people that are making claims like this. And I think that's something worthwhile for all YouTubers to be aware of, to be cognizant of, and to be thinking about with respect to the DMCA, how they think about fair use, the current state of intellectual property, and what they want to talk about with their legislators. And that's been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this video, thank you so much for checking it out. If you saw it on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.